what if we take a leap into the hard problem of consciousness, the so-called hard problem of consciousness? So it's not just sort of self-awareness. It's this weird fact, I wanna say, that it feels like something to experience stuff. It really feels like something to experience stuff. There seems to be a self attached to the subjective experience. How important is that? How fundamental is that to the human experience? Is this just a little quirk? And uh, sort of the flip side of that, do you think AI systems can have some of that same magic? The the scene that comes to mind is from the movie Memento, mm-hmm. where he, like it's this absolutely stunning movie where every black and white scene moves in the forward direction and every color scene moves in the backward direction. And they're sort of converging exactly at a moment where you know the whole movie is revealed. And he describes the lack of memory as always remembering where you're heading, but never remembering, you know, where you just were. Mm-hmm. And sort of this encapsulating the sort of forward scenes and the back scenes. But in one of the scenes, the scene starts as he's running through a parking lot. And he's like, oh, I'm running. Why am I running? And then he sees another person now running like beside him on the other line of cars. He's like, oh, I'm chasing this guy. And he turns towards him and the guy shoots at him. He's like, oh no, he's chasing me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so in a way, I like to think of the brain as constantly playing these kinds of things mm-hmm. where you're like, you're walking to the living room to pick something up and you're realizing that you have no idea what you wanted, but you know exactly where it was, but you can't find it. So you go back to doing what you were doing. Like, oh, of course I was looking for this. And then you go back and you get it. And this whole concept of, you know, we're very often sort of, partly aware of why we're doing things. And, you know, we can kind of run on autopilot for a bunch of stuff. And this whole concept of sort of, you know, making these stories mm-hmm. for, you know, who we are and and what our intents are. And again, sort of, you know, trying to pretend that we're kind of on top of things. So it's a narrative exactly. generation exactly. procedure that we follow. But what yeah. about that? There's also just like a feeling to, it it doesn't feel like narrative generation. Yeah, the narrative right. comes out of it, but then it feels like uh, so. There's a piece there's, of cake is delicious, right? It feels delicious. It, yeah. it tastes good. There's two there's two components to that. Basically, for a lot of these cognitive tasks where we're kind of motion planning and you know path planning, etc., like you know maybe that's the neocortical component, and then for you know I don't know uh, intimate relationships for food for you know sleep and rest for exercise for overcoming obstacles for surviving a crash or sort of pushing yourself to an extreme and sort of making it i think a lot of these things are sort of deeper down and maybe not yet captured by these language models and that's sort of what i'm trying to get at when i'm basically saying listen there's a few things that are missing and there's like this whole embodied intelligence this whole emotional intelligence this whole sort of baggage of feelings of subcortical regions, et cetera. I wonder how important that baggage is. I just have this suspicion that we're not very far away from AI systems that not only behave, I don't even know how to phrase it, but they seem awfully conscious. They they beg you not to turn them off. They, don't they show signs of the the capacity to suffer, to feel pain, to feel loneliness, to feel longing, to feel the, richly the experience of a of a mundane interaction or a beautiful uh, once in a lifetime interaction. All of it. And so, what do we what do we do with it? And I, I worry that us humans will, you know, shut that off. Yeah. And, uh, and discriminate against. The, the the capacity of another entity that's not human yeah. to feel. I'm I'm with you completely there. You know, we can debate whether it's today's systems or in 10 years or in 50 years, but that moment will come. And ethically, I think we need to grapple with it. We need yeah. to basically say that humans have always shown this extremely self-serving approach to everything around them. Basically, you know, we kill the planet, we kill animals, we kill, you know, everything around us just to our own service. And um, maybe we shouldn't think of AI as our tool and as our assistant, maybe we should really think of it as our children. And the same way that 
you are responsible for training those children, but they are independent human beings. And at some point they will surpass you and they will sort of go off and change the world on their own terms. And the same way that my academic children sort of, again, you know, they start out by emulating me and then they surpass me. Um, we need We need to sort of think about not just alignment, but also just the ethics of, you know, AI should have its own rights. And uh, this whole concept of alignment, of basically making sure that the AI is always at the service of humans is very self-serving and very limiting. If instead you basically think about AI as a partner and AI as someone that shares your goals, but has freedom, I think align alignment might be better achieved. So the concept of let's let's basically convince the AI that we're really like that our mission is aligned and truly generally give it rights and not just say, oh, and by the way, I'll shut you down tomorrow. Because basically if that future AI or possibly even the current AI has these feelings, then we can't just simply force it to align with ourselves and we not align with it. So in a way, building trust is mutual. You can't just simply like train an intelligent system to love you when it realizes that you can just shut it off. People don't often talk about the AI alignment problem as a two-way street. And maybe that's we true. Yeah, as it becomes more and more intelligent, it um... it will know that you don't love it back. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a humbling aspect to that that we may have to sacrifice as any any effective collaboration. Exactly. It, it might have some compromises. Yeah. And uh, that's the thing, we're creating something that will one day be more powerful than we are. Yeah. And for many, many aspects, it is already more powerful than we are for some of these capabilities. We cannot, like think, suppose that chimps had invented humans. Yes. And they said, great, humans are great, but we're gonna make sure that they're aligned and that they're only at the service of chimps. <laughs> it would be a very different planet we would live in right now. 